Okay, I'm going to ask you to take your uh, Bible, go to 2 John. Uh, the time is between 85 and 95 AD, meaning these are late, late, late books. All of Paul's books are done. Paul has been dead probably 10, 15, as much as 20 years by the time these books are written. So these are the latest, last issues of the Bible. And you're going to find that in 1st and 2nd John, the issue will be truth. 1st John is about sin. 2nd John is about truth. 3rd John is about relationships. So let's stop and see if we can see what this trilogy is. 1st John, 2nd John, 3rd John. They were not written to be one thing. This one is about sin and the problems of sin. Second John is about truth and how we know it and what we, the fact that we are a truth-bearing organization. And third John is about relationship. I'd like to take a few minutes, starting in second John and going to third John, and I'll explain why in just a moment, but uh, moving between truth and relationship. These two are very, very important, and they're important to the church in the 21st century. As you're looking at the issues of the church, coming out of the first century, sin, truth, and relationship are the three things they're dealing with. 20 centuries later, guess what we're dealing with? Sin, truth, and relationship. So let's stop for a moment. I know I'm going to the middle of it, but I'm doing that specifically because I believe that truth and relationship are both things that we can set apart and in a few minutes help balance one another. Now, stop and look at this little note. John functioned as an elder in the Ephesian church, so the word elder there is to show himself as a teaching elder of the Ephesian church. That's where he was eventually exiled by Domitian into Patmos. That's where we get the, the, the uh, Revelation, the book of Revelation. But here, he's now dealing with the issue of endorsement. There's a problem. He's, they, they're, they're working through what is truth and how do you know truth and how do you deal with truth. So I want to talk to you about truths about truth. Okay? And in the very beginning, look at the very first part. It's, he starts talking to um, this chosen lady. Who is the chosen lady? Well, the, the church is probably at this point, it's either an unknown Christian woman in the, the Asian province, or he's using it figuratively as the church, the churches and the circular letter to the churches. Typically, historically, it's been understood that the lady and her children are the churches that have been started from the Ephesian church. So, the, just like ships are called after names of women, so churches were considered a feminine form and the uh, offspring of them, the baby churches, okay? And so it looks to me like the, the, he builds his opening statement on a very simple idea about truth. It says that it says, the elder to the chosen lady and to her children whom I love in truth. Okay, let's start there. First thing we know about truth. We know that truth is the basis of real love. I love in truth. I don't truth in love. I love in truth. That is, the truth is the basis for real love. The second thing I notice is, and not only I, but also all who know the truth. Stop right there and acknowledge second thing about truth. It is objective and can be known. The Bible says you can know the truth. You shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Here it says, but also all who know the truth. It's possible to know it. It's possible for other people to know that you do know it. Okay? Truth is not entirely subjective. You'll be taught that in a university. It's wrong. Biblically speaking, there is an objective truth in the world. God is the one who posits the absolute truth, and when he says it, it's true because he said it. Now, when you get to verse 2, there's also something else. For the sake of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. What do you see? I see that he says, 
that the truth in verse 2 binds the church together for the sake of the truth which abides in us. Our commonality, what brings us together is truth, not relationship. Relationship comes from truth. You don't do it the other way around. You don't, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to just have a great relationship and have a time together and hopefully truth will come out. No, no, no. Agree on the propositional truth, then the relationship can be built on that. That's why you add to your faith virtue and to your virtue knowledge and the relational aspects of it are way up high, not at the foundation. Any church that gathers together primarily on the basis of economics or race isn't doing it on the basis of a truth claim. You start with a truth claim and build your relationships from there. I know what I'm saying doesn't sound important. It is unbelievably important because church theory is changing. People are coming together largely based on relationships and truth seems to be following it. Don't do it. It will lead you to a disaster because let me put, it, put feet on it. If what we do is we call everyone together based on the fact that they're all divorced, then we build relationship first. Then we try to decide what the truth concerning the word is on divorce. Here's what you're going to find out. When people experience something, it changes their view of the truth. People will take a very solid stand on something until they go through it, and then it's not quite as clear as it was. And a room full of people who have been hurt by something will come up with the wrong conclusions. Never ask a wounded soldier how the battle's going. He's not going to give you the right answer. Okay? So you start with truth and then you move to relationship. I want people to come to grace primarily because they are prepared to hear what it is we're saying as truth claims from the Bible. Then I want them to grow in relationship to one another. Now, I, I would also tell you this. If you look at the end of verse 2, with us forever tells me that truth outlasts lies, deceptions, and tricks. Truth will outlast lies, deceptions, and tricks. At the end of all things, all the lies will be made as lies and truth will stand. Just remember that. If the entire country votes that the sky is black and the earth is flat, it won't make it so. At the end of all things, there is Jesus and he is the truth. And he will make clear exactly what it is he meant about everything from your gender to marriage. It will all be clear. No lie will stand in his presence. Now, if I go down to verse 3, I, I, I find myself understanding that truth outlasts trickery. And he says, grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God the Father, Lord Jesus Christ, and the Son of the Father in truth and love. Truth is actually the binding factor for us to understand the Godhead. We, we can't experience how God works, but He can share with us truth about how He works. And we can find that it's a balance of two things, truth and love. There's this incredible love that, that holds the universe together but it's based on the truths that hold the universe together. Let me go on and say in verse 4 that truth walks. Truth walks. I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth. Truth walks. You, you can see it. It travels. And when it moves from place to place, it's still true. You don't make it true. You discover it. If, if mankind discovered gravity, it didn't make gravity, it just discovered it. When we decide that something is so, that doesn't make it so. It already was. We discovered it. Okay. Now in verses 5 and 6, truth is the basis of our expectations of love. Let, let me see if I can say it to you this. Look at verse 5. Now I ask you, lady, not as those I were writing to, a, a new, writing to you a new commandment, but the one which we had from the beginning that we ought to love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. And this commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. Look at verses 5 and 6. The, the expectation of love is the basis. Truth is the basis of the expectation of love. So the foundation is truth, and on it 
is love. Where do I get that? Look at verse 5. Based on this relationship that we have that comes from the truth, love one another. Walk according to his commandments. And, and that we should do this just like it was from the beginning. He's not introducing a concept of truth that is new. Nor is he introducing a concept of love that is new. Both have been from the beginning. Let me, let me go down to verse 7. Many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge that Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Now, stop and ask yourself a question. What's, is he talking about the antichrist? Is that what he's trying to say? No. What's he saying? He's saying in verse 7 that truth can be measured by the word of God. When it doesn't square with what God's word says, it doesn't matter how many experts believe it. Look at verse 8. Watch yourselves that you do not lose what you have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Watch yourselves concerning, in the verse before, the truth. God is going to measure you based on whether or not you conformed your life to his word. Listen to me carefully. When you decide that his word isn't truth, you are rebelling like the Garden of Eden again. You are saying, God doesn't know how to run the universe. I love more than God. So my love is more important than God's truth. And that's a lie. It's a planted, well-developed lie, but it's a lie. Now, when I get down to verse 9, it says, Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Let me say it this way. Exclusive truth of access to God was taught by Jesus. Exclusive truth of access to God was taught by Jesus that I am not one of the ways, I am the way, the truth, the life. Then if you're not sure what he's saying, no man comes to the Father but by me. And the word man was generic because it includes women and children. So you can't say, well, I'm a woman and therefore I can get there another way. No, you can't. In other words, if, if Christians become, listen to me, if your generation becomes so skittish about truth claims, then we lose Jesus. If it's offensive to people for me to say, I know the truth and you don't believe the truth, then we can't give the gospel anymore. So when we back up on, yeah, I think it's okay if they just change the meaning of life, marriage, gender, then here's what I, what's next, gospel. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. I'm going to tell you there's a way to God, and I'm going to tell you there's every other way that's not to God. And that's the truth adherence is going to be absolute. Access to God was taught by Jesus to be only one way. Let me give you one last one. In verses 10 to 13, truth separates us from supporting everyone. Here's the hard part. Truth separates us from supporting everyone. We can't say, well, I just agree with everyone. You can't. Okay, so in verse 10, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house. Do not give him a greeting. Well, that is so judgy. That is so not tolerant. Look how unloving that is. Coming out of the first century, one of the last things written into the scriptures themselves were, make sure people adhere to truth or draw a line around them because they're not part of you. Now, does that sound like what's on the internet now coming out of the mouths of Christians of your generation? Draw lines around people who do not want to hold the truth. But coming out of the first century, he understood this. By the way, he's the guy who kept commanding love, 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 love. But when he got laid in the message of saying love, 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 the last message wasn't love, it was truth. He said, Guess what? Some of you are loving past the truth and it's killing us. Verse 12. I have many things to write to you. I do not want to do so with paper and ink, but I, have, I hope to come to you and speak face to face so that your joy may be made full. The children of your chosen sister greet you. I think he's talking about one church to another. Now, what do we learn from this? What we learn is that one of the key issues was truth and that that truth being exclusive seemed to bump up against the idea of love. Let's go 20 centuries later, and in the 21st century, do we all understand the tension between truth and love in the church? 
We're trying to show truth in love. But the problem is, there are so many voices that say we've been unloving. Can I just say something? I don't think we've been as unloving as we're being charged with. I think people are saying, you called me a sinner and I'm uncomfortable with that and that's unloving. That's not, it's the truth. If I have cancer, I want my doctor to tell me I have cancer, not lie to me because he's afraid that I'll be unhappy with hearing about it. I think the church is getting charged with something that isn't true and it's been fundamentally planted in the educational system to blow up like a bomb. And I think it's blowing up and I think it's coming back at us. I'm not angry about it. I'm telling you that if you don't get aware of it, you're going to walk into discussion after discussion and get mowed down with tolerance and love language that isn't re rooted in truth. My problem is I want to be a loving guy. I really do. I really am a peaceable person at heart. But I'm living in a generation of Christians that think love can overrun truth, and it can't. It won't work. All you're going to do is give away the store, and then they'll take more. That's what you'll do. You'll decide that we're not going to really take a stand on that as a church. All truth claims say every other explanation is wrong. That's the problem with truth claims. By the way, the Bible is based on truth claims. So what we're doing is we're unraveling that. Okay, go to 3 John for a minute. I want to tell you a story about three Christians. And the story of three Christians is about, so the entire book is about one thing, relationships. Whereas I just hammered away on truth, now I'm going to hammer away on relationships. Okay, so we're all going to be related by the end. Okay, let me read you the book as I have it, underlined. The elder to Gaius, I was glad, brethren, testified you are walking in truth. You are acting faithfully for brethren and especially strangers. They went accepting nothing from Gentiles, therefore support. Diotrephes does not accept what we say. Forbids the, he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out. Do not imitate evil but good. Demetrius has good testimony, or a good testimony, okay? Now, what you see is Paul, uh, Paul, John writing to Gaius and telling Gaius about two other men. I want you to see the three models that we have. First, let's talk about the server that impacts others, and that's in verses 1 through 8. Gaius is a servant. He's a server, or let's use the word servant since it's more appropriate. Servant that impacts others, and we're going to do that in verses 1 through 8. Then after that, we'll look at Diotrephes. Diotrephes. is the rebel that attacks others. And finally, we end up with Demetrius, and Demetrius is more the, um, let's use the word example, the example that draws others. You might also use the word attracts others. All right, take a look at these three men. First, what's a person of impact? He writes to Gaius, and Gaius's first description is the relationship between the elder, between John and Gaius. And what is the first description in verse 1? That they have a love in truth, that that is that they have a true, um, a truth basis to their love that connects them together and a loving basis to their truth that connects them together. The second thing I notice is he says, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health. There's a growing sense in Gaius's life. That is that he's growing and John is encouraging his growth. So let me say it this way. Gaius has a life that impacts others. He's not stagnant. He's growing. In verse 2, he's growing. And he wants him to grow not only in spiritual and emotional things, but also in physical things. He's asking for God for his health. The third thing that I notice is that he has a testimony of truth. Where do I see it in verse 3? Where is his testimony of truth? 
So other brothers say, you're doing the right thing. You're walking in truth. So he has a testimony that is based on truth. And that's something that if you want to make an impact in the world, don't just be this loving person that everyone can push over. Be a person who has a great deal of compassion and love, but stands absolutely on the truth. Nobody respects a person who folds every hand, okay? You're going to have to de declare, when are you going to stand for something? Gentlemen, you need to understand that what they're looking for in you is a man who will stand in a storm, not just fold. The reliability. Look at verse 4, and you'll also see, I have no greater joy than this to hear that my children are walking in truth. He goes on and says that um, you are acting faithfully in what I would say is hospitality. Verses 5 and 6. You take in people, you are accomplishing things for the brethren, and especially the word strangers is guests, travelers. So he says, you're doing an appropriate thing concerning these who are traveling. Now, just a little backstory: The people he's talking about are traveling speakers. And what he's saying is that Gaius is open to people coming with a message from God from other places. Demetri uh, uh, Diotrephes, I'm sorry, Diotrephes is totally against that because he's protective of everything that is said. You're going to find some people with a competitive spirit in Christianity, and you're going to find other people with a giving spirit in Christianity. This is a guy, Gaius, with a giving spirit. He's ready to help people who need help, even if they don't add any fortune, fame, power, or pleasure to him, or they don't add numbers to his church. The, the, the ultimate goal of Gaius was to treat people well and have a great public testimony, not to simply do what would benefit Gaius' local church. Okay, and verse uh, 7, it says, They went out for the sake of the name, that is, they went out in Jesus' name, doing kingdom work, accepting nothing from Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men so that they may be fellow workers with the truth. They were discerning about where they took income and support from. We need to be careful just because somebody flashes money at you doesn't mean you should take it. Very often, how many of you know that some gifts come with strings? Okay, you're going to need to be careful about where you receive. It says, I, I'm so glad that you're helping these guys because they went out not receiving money from the people outside the faith. They went outside, I mean, they went out with only believers to help them and when they came to your door you helped them and that was a testimony of your hospitality guys it's going to become increasingly necessary for Christians to begin to understand the need for hospitality it, it, look when the church can't be the place where we reach people the home has to be that that's what's going to have to be the case and so we're going to have to be the kind of people that have people invite people care for people and when people know that you take care of them, remember, people don't care what you know until they know that you care about them. Okay? They don't care what you know until they know that you care about them. All right, let's look at Diotrephes for a minute. Look at this rebel that attacks others. What, what is the, your sense of this guy? You only have two verses. I wrote something to the church. But Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. So he has rejected the authority of John in a letter John is sent to the church. Diotrephes is apparently someone who is a key leader in a local church that got a letter from John and said, nope, we're not doing it. So he, at the outset, shows a disrespect because rebels at their core are disrespectful. You, and people have to learn respect. Verse 10, for this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does, unjustly accusing us uh, with wicked words. He not only has shown contempt and rebellion and lack of respect, deceit. He's saying things that are deceitful. He's making our words wrong and he's saying things we never said. And I'm going to call him out directly. <gasps> Well, John, that's not love. You keep telling them to love one another. No, it's absolutely love when you call out what's wrong. It's absolutely love when you call out what's wrong. 
And he says, and not satisfied with this, he himself does not receive the brethren either, and he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church. So he's a person in a pastoral or a leadership position that's kicking people out of the church who are hospitable to anybody's words but his. Dictatorial. He's cornered the market on truth. There is no other uh, person who should be giving the truth. And if anyone uh, brings anything else, he throws them out. Don't help them because I'll throw you out if you do. Do you also see an underlying lying defensiveness in him? Watch for defensiveness in your own testimony. Guys, let me tell you. I, um, I, I mean this to be honest and biographical and transparent. In 30-some years of ministry, I've been attacked repeatedly. I'm not whining at you. So have all my colleagues who have been around 30-some years. It goes with the territory. It's like a goalie saying, they took shots at me. That's the job, okay? Don't stand in the goal if you don't want them taking shots at you. The reality of the situation is that what has had to change in the 30-some years isn't the nature of the attack, but the nature of my response. What has to happen is I have to change. First of all, do you know how many years it took me as a pastor to learn that I was the goalie? Once you see yourself as the goalie, then people kicking the ball at you is not weird. It's just normal. Okay? You have to understand that the enemy does that. He knows if he can take out the goalie, he can score the point. That's why he goes after the goalie. Not just the goalie, but he goes after the goalie. Okay? Look, keep your focus and understand that if you become defensive, you become unusable to God. De Demetrius was walking around trying to produce something good. Gaius was walking around trying to produce something good. And Diotrephes was running his own defensive game. Defend Jesus, but not you. Defend Jesus, but not you. When I was a, a young person, I was what was called a preacher boy. Back in the dark ages, that was guys who were going to go into ministry. And our church split. I was no part of that split. I didn't do it. I don't care what anybody says. I wasn't a part of it. Okay, But I watched my senior pastor, who had been there oh, since the dark ages, and he was a fixture in that church. I think he was 30-some years there by the time I got there. Okay, And I watched him. People, people hounded him. And a lot of what they said were just flat-out lies. I knew the man very well, and I knew flat-out. He may have had his foibles, but not what they were saying. Okay? About 100 people sheared off and started another church. And I kept, as a young man, going, you got to answer them. They're saying lies. And he said, you defend Jesus, not yourself. You defend Jesus. And he just looked at me and he said, Randy, come on. Do you know how many lost people there are in this town? 100 people left our church. We can fill those seats again. And this time we can do it with conversions from people who are in darkness. Let's not focus on whether or not they're happy with us. They're not happy with us. They're not going to be happy with us. Let's move on. I, I thought that was so weak. Now, years later, I see that that was incredible strength. The ability to shoot back is far weaker than the ability to not shoot back, to be slapped and turn another cheek is incredibly strong, okay? The guy's defensive. Get into Demetrius. Let's finish this out. By the way, verse 11 makes very clear, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Who is the evil one he's talking about? Diotrephes, don't do what he's doing. The one who does good is of God. The one who does evil is not seeing God. Wow, what a swipe. I mean, seriously. He just said, Diotrephes does evil. Evil doesn't know God. Let's move on. Wow, that's, that's pretty brazen. By the way, I got to tell you about John. John, the writer of this, we have only a couple stories about what he was like late in his life. How many of you remember John was one of the sons of thunder? Which means he was one of those guys that stuff popped out of his mouth that maybe shouldn't have. Here's my great encouragement. The man was a senior citizen. He was in an active theological debate with another guy in town who thought himself to be a pastor of equal quality to John. 
John goes into the bath. We have this from a second century store, uh, source. John is in the bath, bathing in the Roman bath, and this other loudmouth pastor that disagrees with him comes through the door. And John stands up and goes, we must leave. Perhaps the building will fall on us. And he puts on his cloak and leaves. What I love about that story is John never got over his same impulsive nature. God used him to create churches, to the book of Revelation, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, the Gospel of John. Come on, five big books, a big chunk of the New Testament. And the guy could never get past the fact that he had a fiery temper. Demetrius has a good testimony. Look at what attracted others. First of all, it doesn't say he's a good man. What does it say? It doesn't say he's a good man. He has a good testimony, meaning other people feel good about the way he reflects Jesus. That's a good thing. And it says that it's not just from some people, but it's from everyone and from the truth itself. That is, he's known as a guy that other people like to be around, and he's known as a guy who keeps the truth moving. You want, a beast, you want something said of you? I would love Demetrius' epitaph to be mine. People knew that he was a nice guy who really worked hard for the community and stood for the truth. Boy, what a great thing to have said about you. And then it says, we add our testimony. Now he's got the respect of John. Since John was the youngest of the disciples there from the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, how cool would that be to have an endorsement from like John the Apostle, you know? I mean, forget my resume. That's the only line I need. John thinks I'm cool. Okay, I'm good. And then it says, and you know that our testimony is true. I have the respect of the fellowship, uh, John says, and I'm telling you this guy's good. Now, and he ends up saying, there's a lot of other stuff I wanted to write to you, but I really can't write to you. I, I, I just had to write to you about these three guys. I had to write to you, Gaius, about these two other men, one of them who is rejecting us and one of them who has a good testimony. Part of what I love about 3 John is that he doesn't just give you the bad guy, he also gives you a good one. Again, showing that there has to be balance in this. Don't just send the criticism. Look, let's say you get involved with a Bible study and you find yourself surrounded by people and there's a couple people in there just whining and just being negative and whatever. You can address that by saying, well, I'm leaving, and I'm leaving because you're like this and you're like this. But really, a better way to address it would be to say, you know, there's five people at our study, and i got to tell you, two of you have really spoken into my heart because I see this pattern happening. And two of you are just making me crazy because I see this happening, constant whining, constant panic. Are all of you aware that every study you're going to get into, there's going to be one or two of them that are all like Fox news out and all upset and the world's gone to hell in a handbasket and don't you understand? That's what's going to happen. It's part of our times. And they don't know how not to snipe. You know why? Because we haven't learned what it means to live as a minority, surrounded by a majority of people who don't not only believe what we believe, but don't like what we believe. Go to the Middle East where that's been true for generations. And what you'll find is people don't get quite so whiny about persecuting events. They sort of anticipate that any day that they're not persecuted is a really good day. We're going to have to grow the Church of Jesus Christ in America to the point where they can be a minority voice in their community without walking around thinking that somebody stole their lunch. By the way, someone stole their lunch. We built the community and they're stealing it. We, I get that. So get over it, because you don't control that. You can't do anything about it. You have to know when to fold, okay? You have to know. And you have to move on and not make your life about how, I mean, do you have friends like this? Panicking every, every you know, ISIS is going to come and start a camp next to your house, and they're going to steal your guns, and the government's going to take away your children. And Okay. What do you want me to do about all that? How about I settle down and think about, you know what? My next-door neighbor needs Jesus today. How old is John? If he was, let's say, 15, 16 when he meets Jesus, that means he is in his 80s at the point in which he's writing this, which means it's written more like this. 